Good evening. I'm Tim Bolton, Head of Programmes here at Dartington. And on behalf of everyone at Schumacher College in Dartington, I'd like to welcome you to this, our fifth online Joy of Six Schumacher College Earth Talk. And thank you all so much for supporting the work of Schumacher College. We've been holding Earth Talks for a number of years, face to face in the old Poston and occasionally the Great Hall at Dartington. It's a fundamental part of our learning community and we look forward to doing so again as soon as is possible. However, Schumacher College has a very long history of debate and research around our ecological and environmental catastrophe. And it feels important in this moment of global crisis that we reach out to our community, alumni, in those in search of a new normal. As in previous talks, the audience appears to be joining us from across the globe and the presenters are spread out across the UK as well. So although most of us are currently in lockdown, the world somehow feels increasingly interconnected and all of us increasingly interdependent. This talk is the fifth in the series of six, which take place every Wednesday evening and which I hope you will want to attend. If you're new to the series, then previous talks are also available on the Schumacher College website, as is an archive of talks from the last few years. We're just finalising the following six talks due to start at the beginning of July, and more details will be available shortly. So first, a few words about the format of the evening. In a moment, I'll hand over to Amanda Scott to present her talk. We do want the session to be as accessible and interactive as possible. So please do use the chat button on the bottom of your screen. And I can see loads of you already are and building up a really good chat there. Um, and also um, to, to share ideas between yourselves and the audience and also to us and the panel. But also please do use the Q&A link um, again at the bottom of the window. You might not be able to see all of the questions as they stack up, but I'll be able to later. Manda might respond to some of the questions as we go along and I'll have a chance to put other questions to her during and at the end of the presentation. In total, we anticipate the session to last about an hour. So let me start by introducing you to this evening's speaker, Manda Scott. Manda is a best-selling, award-winning novelist, podcaster and smallholder. She is an alumni of Schumacher College and an occasional tutor. Manda has in the past year, along with founding Accidental Gods, become a conscious evolutionary. She believes that we're on the edge of the next evolutionary step, and that is one of consciousness, consciously chosen, that we are now the conscious creators of our own destiny, but that we can only make it if we work as an integral part of the wider web of the more than human world. Her life is now devoted to finding ways to bring the maximum number of people to a point where they can connect with the greater web in a way that is authentic, grounded, coherent, and above all, constructive. She believed this was timely before the coronavirus pandemic. Now she believes it's urgent. We are the people and the time is now. Welcome back, Manda, and over to you. I need to unmute myself, there we go. Thank you everybody on this amazing and beautiful Wednesday evening in Britain and wherever you are around the world. I saw Australia and South Africa in the chat. So thank you for making the time in your lives to do this. I don't know about you guys, but life became suddenly very busy when lockdown happened. So I am going to take over and share my screen. That and that. And then we have that. So, um, so the first thing I want to tell you is that I've had almost no sleep because you see the middle person in there, that little one, that arrived somewhere between two o'clock and four o'clock this morning. So I just wanted to share that with the world, really, as we step into, oh no, sorry, press the wrong button already. No, okay, so it's not doing what it's meant to do. This is kind of interesting. Oh, guys, right. This is because I'm on the wrong side. You can tell I've had no sleep. I'm really sorry. Okay, let's try again. Oh, God. Right. Then there. And then there. Bingo. Right. Sorry about that. Okay, so we, you know the premise on which I am working because you just heard it. Tim just explained it fully. I want to tell you a little bit about how we get there and then where I think we go from here. 
So, and I'm starting off with Daniel Schlachtenberger just because he is one of the brightest people on the planet at the moment. And I believe that when he says emergence from complex systems is the closing, closest thing to magic that science understands, that matters on every level that we could interpret that. So staying with systems theory and emergence from complex systems, I would like to propose that humanity is a hyper complex system. This presupposes that we know the difference between complicated and complex. Complicated things are linear and predictable. They tend to be built by people. So a Boeing 747 is a very, very complicated thing. There are over 6,000 parts. I googled it. But if somebody gave the instruction sheet and 6,000 boxes with all the right bits in, carefully numbered, and you were halfway intelligent, you could put them together in a way that would end up resembling a Boeing 747. And people do this all the time. Before lockdown, the skies were full. And the Boeing 747 is predictable in that if you, I'm assuming they have a steering wheel, I've never really looked, turn the steering wheel to the left, it will move to the left and it will move consistently to the left. It won't suddenly start accelerating into a leftward spiral. Similarly to the right, when you pull out the brakes, it goes a bit slower. When you put your foot in the gas, it goes a bit faster. I am aware that flying planes is slightly more complicated than that, but it's still complicated. Complex systems are not linear and they are not predictable. And living things, living systems, tend to be complex. Cells are complex. Organs are complex. When you join the cells into the organs and join the organs into a body, the body becomes complex. Our bodies are complex, which is one of the many reasons why reductionist medicine stops working with any degree of complexity of whatever is going on in pathology. If you bring a lot of people together in a culture, that culture is by definition complex. It's not linear and it's not predictable. And our system, uh, 10,000 years ago, we were complex, but we were complex in small tribes that didn't connect very much. And then we moved on, we moved on, we grew our population. We already had language 10,000 years ago, but the next evolution was, was writing. And then we could write something down and send it across the world and share our ideas in, in wider spaces. A step on from that, we developed the printing press and then the printing press spread around the world, and then we could take our ideas and spread them more swiftly. Then we got radio, and then we got television, and then we got the internet. And now things are moving very, very fast. We'll come back to that in a minute, because I want to have a quick look at a man called Ilya Prigozhin, who was a Russian physicist who got his Nobel Prize for his work on complex systems. And he, suggested that complex systems trend towards maximal complexity. And when they reach that point of maximal complexity, beyond which it is the chaos of that is so huge that you get a split. And you either get chaos and extinction, or you get emergence into a new system. And the point about emergence into new systems, what Daniel Schwachtenberger says is the closest thing to magic that science understands is that the new system is completely unpredictable from the perspective of the old system. If you want to talk about that later, we can go into examples. The most obvious and often used example is that of a caterpillar, which is munching around eating leaves until it grows big and fat, and then it spins itself a cocoon, and it basically dissolves. What's inside a chrysalis is DNA soup. It bears no resemblance whatsoever to the caterpillar. Its chaos is total. But then little imaginal cells arise. And in the beginning, they are destroyed. They're, they're viewed as being alien. But then more arise and more arise, and they clump together to form little imaginal islands. And the imaginal islands clump together to form imaginal organs. And eventually, a butterfly emerges. And if you were handed a chrysalis for the first time in your life, and you had no idea that that was happening, you would not predict a butterfly from this little green grub or whatever color grub that spun its little web and turned itself into soup. What is new is not predictable from what came before. That's really important. So we are now a hyper complex system. 
Jordan Hall was working on self-organizing collective intelligence, which is basically groups of us on the internet getting together, sharing ideas, fomenting new ideas very fast. And in his work before lockdown, he reckoned that we were two orders of magnitude more complex by the end of last year than we had ever been at any point in the history of humanity, which is to say, so far as we know, at any point in the history of consciousness on this planet. And if you believe James Lovelock, that means consciousness anywhere in the cosmos. I, I don't actually, but it's an interesting thought experiment. And then lockdown happened. And I don't know about you guys, but I seem to have people emailing me at least an order of magnitude more than they did before. And there are Zoom calls happening every night, multiples thereof. The level of connectivity around the globe has gone up, I would say, by at least one more order of magnitude. Therefore, I believe we are trending towards maximal complexity. We don't know where that point is. But then the question is, what, when do we reach maximal complexity? How will we know when we've got there? And then what happens? So park that thought. Because the second premise is that Insofar as we understand evolution, and there are clearly gaps, evolution occurs in any species under moments of intense pressure. And even before we went into the coronavirus pandemic, we were under intense pressure from climate catastrophes, from the total ecocide of the biosphere. We're in the middle of the sixth mass extinction. I'm sure you all know that. We are at points of societal intensity where the possibility of nuclear war by those who assess these things has risen sharply and chemical war, biological war. We're also the next big thing coming down the tracks that nobody seems to be talking about is antibiotic resistance, which is very, very close. And all of these things are potentially fatal. And this is what pushes evolution. If we're in our niche and everything is peaceful, then we are not driven to evolve. If things start to become deeply uncomfortable such that we might become extinct, then we have to evolve our way out of it. But we don't evolve anymore by somebody having slightly longer legs and that being an evolutionary advantage because they can run faster than the gazelle and then their descendants and descendants all have slightly longer legs until you have a new species of person who has slightly longer legs. That doesn't happen. That probably hasn't happened for the last 50,000 years, certainly the last 10,000. How we choose our partners are much more based on societal and cultural issues. And whether children survive or not is more to do with the technology available to keep them alive. So that idea that species evolve when under pressure is still true, but we don't have time to evolve by the slow increments of DNA, even if we were still doing it. So then we want to bring those two together. We are at the point very close, I think, to the point of maximal complexity and we are due an evolutionary shift. And so my third premise, and I am not alone, this is not my idea, I, I, it's utterly derivative, is that the next evolutionary step could be one of consciousness that we could choose to evolve. And that would be the first time that evolution in the whole of the history of this planet, possibly per love block, the whole of the history of the cosmos, where evolution is taking control of itself, where we can make the choice to change our consciousness such that the nature of what it is to be human is transformed. So I'm not alone in thinking this. There are entire corners of the internet that are talking about conscious evolution. The questions are, can it be done? I would always say, if not, why not? And, and what is the worst that could happen if we try? Why, at least we could try this because frankly, we're facing so many cliff edges, we have to try something. But if this is the case, how do we do this? And the other corners of the internet if you look at the bottom line, pretty much think that if we meditate for another 100 hours, 1000 hours, whatever, get enough people together, get a collective group, a critical mass meditating, that will lift us. 
or we think very hard and we develop ideas about what conscious evolution might be and that will take us forward or we just give up and implant nanochips in our brains and those of you who think that might be fun i would refer you to sam harris's ted talk on ai it's interesting sobering and i haven't found any holes in it yet so i won't actually let's take you back a step very very briefly because time is moving on yep how i got to this was partly that I spent a year at Schumacher thinking and in the process of that because I did the regenerative economics course and I wrote my first term paper on what would shamanic economics look like because we had been taught all about Buddhist economics and the gross national happiness index and one of our lovely lecturers had said they are doing shamanic economics in I think Ecuador because they wanted to put in a dam and they went and they did a ceremony to placate the spirits of the river so that they could put the dam in. And this is therefore shamanic economics. And, and of all the things that made my head explode in the learning about economics, that was quite high on the list because in my world where my spiritual path is shamanic, that's not shamanic economics. Shamanic economics would be at the very least, you go to the river and you go, okay, we have this problem. What would be a good way to solve it? And I would be really surprised if the river said, well, what you need to do is pour millions of tons of concrete about here. That's not going to happen. So I wanted to write my term paper on what would shamanic economics look like? And I did some dreaming. I did some journeys. I did some walks out in the world where if I get it right and I'm balanced on the knife edge of the moment, the spirits that I work with are seeing through my ears, seeing through my eyes, sorry, hearing through my ears, and I am seeing through them seeing. And I was doing this, I turned a corner, there was the physical manifestation of the entity that I worked with at that point. And what it said, what I perceived it saying was, you're asking the wrong question. Which wasn't so good because I had two days to hand in and term papers are quite scary when you haven't written a paper for 30 years. And so I thought, what is shamanic economics was quite a good question. And it turned out that what I needed to be asking was, what are we here for? Because there is no point in setting up an economic system or a cultural system or any other kind of system until we know what it's here for. So I started thinking about that quite hard. Fast forward a couple of years, we got to the winter of 2018 and I sat with the fire, which is what I do every winter solstice. And basically asked what do you want of me and the very short answer was this that's not how it came through that night um but there were a couple of images that made sense and there was an absolute instruction to start teaching at scale because the way that i was teaching the shamanic work was too small and took too long so i got to okay conscious evolution might be a thing and therefore it might happen fast and we need fast we are running at cliff edges. So I did, I spent the whole of last year asking, what do you want us to do and how do you want us to do it? Because if we're going to consciously evolve, I really don't believe that meditating more, philosophizing more, or heaven help us, nanochips are the root. All of those are extraordinarily anthropocentric. And, and that's not the way that I think the world is. It's not the way I want the world to be. And it also seems to me that it's, it's just arrogant. So in my asking, what I got to was a vision, which, like, yeah, here we go. One of the things that came that first night was this image of the world as seen from space. And one day I will get my lovely partner, who's a graphic designer, to wrap around this image very, very, very fine filaments of light in an incredibly complex web all the way around the globe. And because I was at night, it was dark, I saw it in moonlight. Since then, I've seen it in sunlight. And at every crossing point of each of these many, many, many squillions of very fine fibers, all of them crossing in lots and lots and lots of different ways, every crossing point is a node of consciousness. And the felt sense of that and the felt sense since has been that if we me individually, we as a species, could learn to take our place in the web of consciousness that wraps the entire planet. Because some of these nodes are people, 
but lots of them aren't. Most of them aren't. They're trees and rocks and red kites and mountains and rivers and mitochondria and mycelial networks and whales and oceans. Everything else in this world, this is a very animistic view, plays a part in this web of consciousness. And the web of consciousness knows where we need to go and how we can get there. What we need to do as people, having got ourselves to the place we are now, where I think this is possible, is get ourselves into a state where we can take our place in that web in a way that's effective. So this is the steps that I came up with, partly because I think it's useful to have a structure to teach and partly because these seem to be the parts that were important. So the first of these is reawakening into connection. And the basis of the reawakening is that I believe that connectedness is part of our human heritage. For almost all of human evolution, hundreds of thousands of years, we lived in context with the earth. We knew where we needed to go and why we needed to go there. We were an integral part. We were wildlife, basically. We were just a slightly different form of that wildlife. And the thing about wildlife is that everything talks to everything else. Everything is part of a web. We cut ourselves off from that. I still don't fully understand why. If you listen to the people who have near-death experiences, they come back and say everything is happening exactly as it should, which I sometimes find really hard to get my head around, but maybe it's true. And one of the things that I come up again and again in my shamanic practice is, that's not my problem. My problem is to look at where we are now, look at where do I have agency, and what can I do with that agency that is useful. It's not going, are, are you sure we needed to be here? Because we're here, we can't change that. So I look at newborn infants, not just the full, grandchildren, um, and they are little hunter-gatherers when they're born. We domesticate them out of their connectedness. And therefore each of us can reach back to that connectedness. It is there in our lifetimes. And it's definitely there, all of shamanic practice is based on this. So what I spent most of last year working out was how can we take ordinary people off the street? A, a woman with, with three kids under the age of 10, who is now in lockdown and teaching from home. Somebody who pre-lockdown was trying to hold down half a dozen jobs just to pay the mortgage. How can we take anyone and help them to rebuild this level of connection in ways that are authentic and grounded and heartfelt? So hold that thought. The next stage, or at least in a parallel, these two have to come together, is the growing into coherence. And this is one of the things that I think we could only do this now, is that we now have understandings of neuroscience, of neurophysiology, of neuropsychology, of neuropsychoimmunology, of the ways that our energy field and our mind, our head mind, interact the science of that is exponential now, which is to say we know more this year than the sum total of everything that we knew before. And unless lockdown really gets in the way, we will know next, more next year than the sum total of everything that came before. This is an exponential curve. And one of the things that really makes a difference is something that's actually been known for nearly 100 years now, which is Hebb's postulate, which is what fires together, wires together. The things that I choose to let my mind do are the things that my mind will do better because it's done them more often. I, there's a whole earth talk to be done on neuroscience, neuropsychology, neurophysiology. We haven't got time. But the fact that we know these things now, we know how to take ourselves from beta brainwaves through alpha to theta to delta to gamma. We know how to do that in ways that the Buddhist sages, for all the extraordinary technology of Buddhist meditation practice, didn't know. So what we need to do is to make the connections and make them in a way where we can find that sense of inner coherence, of stillness, of inner quiet, of all of the different parts of ourselves, at least all being in the same field. This is my metaphor of this all being chariot horses so that we're not constantly at war with ourselves, we're not judging ourselves, we are finding generosity of spirit for ourselves and the rest of reality. And we know 
how to be still. And then we know how to recognize what's mine, what is in my baseline, and what's coming in. Because what we need to do next is to be able to ask for help. This is fundamental to shamanic practice. Shamanic practice is about asking for help. But now it's fundamental, I believe, to us making this conscious evolutionary step. We need to take our part in the web of life and we need to be able to stand there with the confidence of knowing that we are the right person in the right place at the right time and go, what do you need me to do? And be able to do it without the voice saying, you're making that up or without us actually making it up. We have to be, do it in a way that isn't flipped off course by our egos or our projections or our fears or our hopes. We have to have the coherence and we have to have the absolute connectedness to hear answers that are clear, constructive and coherent. And we can practice that. It is, this is not a one hit wonder where we join the web and go, okay, that's it guys, teach me. We can practice the asking for help as we're making the connections so that at the point when we feel absolutely, wholly, 100% fully connected, then we know that when we ask, what do you want of me? The answers that we get will be clear, constructive and coherent and we can act in the moment because that's what people are good at. And when we've got that, all of that, and we've worked out how to find the questions, we can talk about that later if you want. Then the last step is the letting go making the empty handed leap into the void. My partner says I shouldn't say that because it confuses people, but I don't think it's going to confuse a Schumacher audience. I hope not, anyway. We need to be able to understand the boundaries of our own thinking such that we can drop them. No problem is solved from the mindset that created it. This is partly why doing more meditation, doing more philosophizing, sticking in bloody nano chips is not going to work. They are all attitudes from the mindset that created the problems with which we are beset. We need to be able to step into the void and let go of everything so that we are not in that mindset, so that something new can arise. We need to drop all the old narratives and this, because I've started doing this with people and I have to go a little bit ahead of the rest, this is where most of my attention is going now is what are the limits of what I believe and what happens if I stop believing it? And one of the things that really helps, we learned about Donella Meadows, who was an amazing and wonderful systems thinker when I was at college. And she had a list of 12 leverage points. And the second to last one, the second to top one, sorry, the second to most effective was to change the paradigm. And I went away from college going, yep, I can change paradigms. I will write books, I will make television, I will do what it takes to change the paradigm. But the top one is to abandon all paradigms. And I never got my head around that. I didn't even, I couldn't see how it would be possible until I started doing the work that we needed to work out what was I going to make of what the fire had shown. And she was right. We need to abandon all paradigms. We need to stand in that space where anything is possible and where we're listening to the rest of the web of life. Pardon me. And I think that this is not something that a few of us can do alone. We need a critical mass. I don't know what the critical mass is. Gurdjieff said that if we had 200 fully enlightened beings, we could change the world. I don't even know where he got that number from. I don't know what fully enlightened means. So I'm heading for a critical mass that's a lot bigger than 200. Because it also, this has to be a co-creation. This isn't something where we're all sitting in isolation, beavering away, you know, meditating for 14 hours a day and not talking to each other. This is something that we do in the world, of the world, every moment of the day, and we're connecting and we're sharing and we're building within the chaos of a hyper complex system moving towards maximal complexity. We are building the possibility of change. So in order to get to that, we created Accidental Gods. This is not intended to drag you there, but it's to let you know that it exists. And the key, the bit that is the most important I believe, is the reawakening into connection. How can we get people connected to the web of life? Because then we can ask for help. Long before we get to the moment of conscious evolution, every moment of the day then becomes a process of connecting and asking how to connect more. And the first chink of that is the hard bit. 
and then it begins to accelerate. I apologize to the cat that is trying to break through my door. We also, in Accidental Gods, are endeavoring to use neuroscience to work out because we can all decide that what we really want to do is do the visualizations and do the meditations. And we all know that we start in 1st of January with some really good ideas. And by the 1st of February, most of our meditations are not happening. But we have behind us a neuroscience or behavioral science of how to build habits that actually endure so that we can do what we want to do on the 1st of January and still be doing it in September and December and January of next year. We discovered after we started up that we needed a lot more stuff than just the visualizations and the meditations, so we added those in. And then, so all the way along last year, we were building this and building this, and it was a very slow and iterative process. And my lovely partner who designs the website and does all the tech kept saying, we're not ready. And it got to September last year and she was saying, we're not ready. And I said, no, we have to get this out by the winter solstice. We absolutely do. And we got closer and closer and closer to the winter solstice and the conversations were getting more and more tense of why, why does this have to be out by the winter solstice? And I, I don't have no idea. I just know that it does. And I've got the hill and go, guys, why? And, and that's not your problem is so often the answer when I do shamanic work. That's not your problem. Just make sure it's out. So it was. And, and six weeks in, we discovered why, or actually less than that. And I don't know if this pandemic is a dress rehearsal for us so that we can see if we can get ourselves towards conscious evolution faster, or if it's that we are actually hitting tipping points and that we are actually reaching maximal complexity beyond which bifurcate chaos and extinction or shift to a new system. I don't know. I guess we find out. So where are we? We're discovering how fast can we bring this critical mass and what is that critical mass? And I don't know the answers to these. These are the questions that I am throwing out to the greater collective of people who watch Earth Talks and to the greater collective of the world. How fast can we do this? And the thing I think that we're discovering is that it has to matter to the people doing it. It probably has to matter more than anything else, which is not to say that this becomes more important than raising your children in the best way that you can or whatever else takes that space for you. It's to say that raising your children becomes an integral part of endeavouring to move towards conscious evolution. And how? How can we do this? How can we bring this to more people? How can we enlarge the idea? How can we change the narrative from the one that is so easy to get so scared and so triggered by to something that enables us to feel our way to a different way of being? I have ideas of that. We can talk about them. In, in the Q&A when we come up. I would like to share, Rob Berbea died recently, which is incredibly sad, um, but Daniel Thorson, who is one of his um, American students, said to me in a podcast that Rob's foundation was everything must be fluid before we can proceed. So I've taken that as something that we need to be doing. This was shared with me by Jonathan at college. And I think this is one of the things that we absolutely need to take on board. We need new narratives if we're going to move towards a new consciousness. And that takes us back. Oh no, Hansi Farnach, yeah. Whoever has mastered the most perspectives by the time she dies wins. Discuss, we could discuss that later. And that takes us back to Daniel. And that takes us back to the ponies. So that's what I wanted to say to you, and um, now we're back to ordinary Zoom, there we go. And open to questions, open to discussion, open to doing meditation, open to doing whatever the collective wants us to do. Thank you. Thank you so much, Manda. Um, that was um, really inspirational, and I think um, it's certainly caused me to scratch my head more than slightly. And okay. I think, if I could maybe kick off with something which seems quite common to quite a number of the comments in the chat and the, in the questions, which is really how abandoning paradigms, how on earth is that possible? How can we set about doing that? Yes. And I think quite a number of the questions are how. I think everybody's with you in terms of yes. this. Ah. Being, um, because, uh, so 
so the reason that's the fourth of four is that it's not easy um and i'm working on it and the honest answer to that is i don't have a structured way of teaching that because it's still quite fluid in my own experience the, the how for me at the moment is i do what it takes to let my dust settle so to speak i come into a place of stillness insofar as i can i ask for help because i think that's absolutely crucial and then i explore the boundaries of who i am and there's a sense of the weave of who i am the texture that feels like it's me loosening and expanding and then fraying and within that loosening and expanding and praying, there becomes room for reality to be other than I believe it to be. So it's not, this is not a head-based thing. It's very much a, an energetic perspective-based sense. My felt sense of who I am is shifting. And I, I can't say more than that at the moment. I, and it may be that, you know, if you ask me this again in a couple of months time, I'll say something completely different. But it's something to which I am giving really quite large amounts of time at the moment because I think it's it's crucial but at the moment with the people who we're working with the people who've joined accidental gods we're still working on the how do we connect how do we make the connections with the web because the key to this is once we start connecting you can ask for help and I don't think that the letting go is possible without asking for help so it it becomes then the, the hard bit is getting to a point where the asking for help feels real and doesn't feel just like a set of projections and, and that the answers don't feel like a set of projections and the great thing is you know we can test this i used to be a veterinary surgeon and i practiced insofar as i could evidence-based medicine and now i really want to practice evidence-based spirituality so you test it you ask a question and you get an answer and you go and you can see does that work is that right and and so we can do we, we've got time i think for people to do these little iterative cycles and to become honest with themselves so that we don't because we don't have to make stuff up we haven't got time to make stuff up we do have time to sit and listen to what's happening inside of ourselves and outside ourselves and find the places within us where these merge i'm sorry not to be able to give you a clearer answer to that but ask me again in six months Thank you very much, Mandy. Yeah, I don't think it, um, the, in asking the question, it wasn't that we thought you were going to have a simple um, response, but I think it's the thing which has caused many of us to start scratching our heads. Um, uh, Gunther asks, um, what I'd like to understand in an open and inclusive way, why is there a large understanding and practice of con consciousness, evolu consciousness evolution from largely Eastern wisdom spirituality? What about other spiritual traditions? How could a Western societal consciousness evolution look like? I don't know. <laughs> um, I'm not even sure I understand the question. What would a Western societal consciousness yeah, so I suppose, um, A lot of the people doing this are, are American. You know, um, but, but we are using mostly Buddhist tools of reflexivity if you like just because they're the ones that are oldest and have been written down in most detail i think um sorry the dog is just breaking in <laughs> so um i have no idea is the honest answer to that question um and, and it would be really interesting to explore because this is meant to be totally inclusive it's not meant in any way and and the ways that we find the ways that work for each of us to reach points of inner coherence and outer connection we do what works do whatever works guys it's you know i was originally trained at sami ling so i use buddhist techniques but yeah and then i use shamanic techniques use what works it doesn't matter how you get there what matters is that we get there so mm. yeah so to let us know what it looks like yeah thank you um suzanne dali asks uh, the big problem is that the major narrative in the west is the apocalypse until we get beyond that, we cannot evolve. Too many fo uh, folks buy into it consciously and subconsciously. Yes, and so this is one of the meditations that arose when, when the pandemic started, or at least when it hit us and we went into lockdown and I went up the hill and said, what do we do? And I was given a meditation that now has become, it's part of my daily practice, which is, can I sit in stillness, open my heart space, do whatever that takes, and can I generate 
a felt sense in my body, again, another energetic felt sense of how the world would be if we got everything right from here on in. And this is not to get my head wrapped around all the bits that go, well, it's obviously perfect as it is. This is, what is my felt sense? If we got everything right from now, and it took me weeks, it probably took me till at least halfway through April before I got past all the rubble in my head going, but we can't, it's all going to be horrendous. Basically, we're all heading down the road of Mad Max where we're going to end up being kebabbed by our bigger and nastier neighbours over piles of burning tyres. That is just the way it's going. And, and nothing else is going to happen. And that's, this is, yeah, that's an interesting exercise, but it's not the point. The point is we cannot go somewhere if we don't know how it feels to get there. And so can I alone generate in my sense that feeling of how I would feel if everything were right. And what I discovered was I didn't know how much fear I was holding until I started to dismantle it brick by brick, pebble by pebble, layer by layer. I didn't know it was possible to feel so relaxed and so at ease in my own skin until I started really working on how that might happen. So you're right, at the moment the narrative is catastrophe. And we can go with that, but we have a choice. You know, this is what fires together, wires together. And the more each of us practices, practicing how we could get it right and how that feels in my body, the more I can set that as a template for myself. I cannot get somewhere that I cannot envision how it feels. So, so we need to change that. And the more of us doing it, the more it becomes a collective possibility. And it's not something we do with our headlines. It's not an argument that we make. It's a felt sense. I hope that makes sense. Mm. It, it certainly does. It's, it's interesting because I think there's quite a conflict in my mind between um, our contemporary culture that seems to have a very strong streak of anti-intellectualism, of, mm. of um, uh, not wanting to um, uh, look to people as experts or to people who can be um, absorbed in um, their own kind of um, intense thought patterns. Um, and so you, in lots of ways, you have a kind of diagnosis and a treatment, potentially, that you're, you're kind of talking about here, and it's a bit, maybe a bit clinical. But many people haven't spotted that they have an issue and certainly don't trust the notion that actually spending more time with themselves is going to be the solution. Yeah. And so how do we reach the people who have spotted that? Because I don't, at the moment, I don't think I've got time or the interest to speak to people who don't want to listen. That sounds really arrogant, but I, I think we're up against a very tight time frame. You know, I've read the deep adaptation paper. It terrified me. And so then if we can reach the people who are aware that they want to spend more time with themselves, that's still, I think, hundreds of thousands of people. And the thing that we all know, you know, from the work of XR to all of the energetic work that we do is that the more something becomes common currency, the more the idea spreads. This is not about taking people off the street who don't want to do this and going, okay, now you just need to sit down and meditate because you're going to change the world. That's, that is never going to happen and it's not going to work. People, you know, people have to want to do this. So what I'm trying to do is provide a gateway, an avenue, uh, a, a system, a, a something that works for the people who do want to do it in the hope that in the being, the change that we want to see in the world, we then influence the people around us who want to know how we did that. That's the way change happens. It doesn't happen, I think, by standing on street corners shouting at people and telling them they've got the wrong idea. Not that anyone was suggesting we did that, but you know, that's, that's the polar opposite of, if we can be our, our way, the way that we are, then that influences the people around us and the ripple effect moves up. Yeah, thank you, Mando. Well, I suppose th this is a, bit, a kind of, perhaps it's too similar a question, but maybe if I ask it, so it's from, from Arthur Pace, and it said, um, thank you for the inspiring uh, talk. Do you have any thoughts on how conscious evolution spreads uh, once one is reawakened, grown into co um, uh, coherence, um, has asked for help and has let go? What does one do to bring about general conscious e consciousness evolution? Is there some sort of circle or do we get um, let go individually? And that's it. Um, that's an interesting question. So uh, the honest answer is I don't know. I have, <coughs> but what I kept getting as I was doing the, the work towards this was a sense that 
And, and actually I was told, and I keep questioning this, so, so this is what I was told and it may not be true, <laughs> or at least my head mind does, has trouble accepting it, is that one person goes through a portal and they open the door for everybody else to go through. But we don't know who that one person is and we need a critical mass. Everybody needs to have got to a certain level for that one person to do that. that we, it's not going to be the case that one person is able to do that. We have to get enough of a critical mass so that one can do that and, and who knows who that one will be. I'm not sure that that's true, but what I'm certainly with the vision that I had of the web around the globe, which has been my kind of driving push these last 18 months, is it's we do this together, that this is a co-creation, that part of what we're learning is that this is, we're not, in, we have to do the work ourselves, but we don't have to do it alone. And there's a difference, you know, I need to go out and sit and do the work and, and work out how to do stuff, but I have now got a whole, whole community of people who are joining this that, that are heartfelt connected. And the more that we can begin to build that community, the more we have a sense of a co-creation, the more we help each other to do the stuff that we need to do. I think it's not something that we do alone, alone. Yeah, thanks. I do. I'm, I'm, um, I'm not s struggling with this because I, I, I can feel a real sense of power in it, but I suppose I'm, I'm trying to work out. Covid, for me, the lockdown feels like um, it, a real moment of great potential. Um, mm -hmm. Massive change. Governments suddenly have found that they can take radical action when yeah. they have the... It's not just a magic money tree, there's an entire forest. Yes. <laughs> yes. So I suppose I'm, I'm really, one of the, the questions for me at the moment is how do we make sure we don't squander the opportunity that seems to be in front of us? And I, and I'm, and I suppose maybe I'm, I'm too solution focused and trying to chase a speedy way to get to that answer, but I wonder how your process can help us get to that point of not squandering. Um, by, because I think the problem we have at the moment is, you know, I go back to no problem is solved from the mindset that created it. I think there are amazing things. I, I'm sure you're all familiar with um, Joanna Macy's three pillars of the great turning. She has holding patterns, systems change, shifts in consciousness. This is the shift in consciousness. We still need the systems designers to be creating new systems and we need the holding patterns. You know, COVID has provided the ultimate holding pattern. You know, there are ships out in the ocean full of oil going nowhere. That is a holding pattern. Thank you, COVID for all the other havoc that's happened, that's still useful. We still need the systems designers to be creating new systems, but those systems are created at the moment from the mindset of the rest of us. We have to, I think, the, the, the shift in consciousness has to be shifting beyond that. So my, I, I, you know, I, we, humanity rising is a thing. These earth talks are a thing. What we're doing is we're sharing ideas of ways of being, ways of thinking that have the potential for change. My belief system, and you know, I'm going to have to let it go at some point because we have to let go of everything, but my belief system at the moment is that energetic shift happens before emotional and narrative shift, which happens before actual shift on the ground. And that this is creating the energetic shift and it's creating the shift back to being a part of the web of consciousness, because it doesn't matter how amazing our systems designs are or how fantastic our holding patterns, if we're not doing it as an integral part, an actual integral part of the web of life, then we are going to destroy everything. We have to start getting to the point where we can ask, what do you want of me? And be acting on the answers throughout the days. And then the systems that we design as a result of that have a chance of actually being regenerative, I think. So, and I'm not suggesting that I'm the only person endeavouring to do this, but I think this is, this is our route to getting there. Does that answer the question? Again? Yeah, yeah, no, it does. It does, I think. And, and Gunter as well is, is pointing um, a number of people through the chat to um, Arab's recently published 2050 scenario for four divergent futures, which I think also is quite interesting for those of us who also like a kind of a um, very solutions focused response as well. Yeah. Um, Thank you. I'm just looking to, to... 
A number of people are, are asking around um, questions around kind of trauma. Um, and so Sue, for instance, is a, is a good example um, uh, that should um, have you looked at trauma as the main problem which keeps people stuck and stops them evolving? Your quote, everything must be fluid before we can proceed, resonated with my study in collective and personal trauma. That's really interesting. So part of what I'm doing with Accidental Gods is I've got a podcast and the one that came out yesterday is with a somatic experiencing trauma psychotherapist called Susan Schlauter from Canada. Um, and it was the second of two because our first one, we, we got so geeky into the neuroscience of polyvagal theory, we didn't actually have time to look at and, and then what do we do about this? And really I was wanting to look at how can we really connect during lockdown. Um, but yes, the thing is, yes, yes, you're absolutely right. And I'm not going to give my energy at the moment to asking how we got here. I am giving my energy to asking how can I reconnect with the world in a way that's authentic so that I can, we can move forward and out. I think for me, if I were to go through the cycles of what got us here, it would feel like a rabbit hole. That isn't to say that it isn't a completely valid thing for other people to do, but I am really, really solutions focused in terms of how can, I don't, I really don't think we've got very long. And I think that if I were to start looking at how we got here, for me, that would be looking in the rear view mirror and I want to be, I want to be making the heart connections. So then the question becomes, does the trauma prevent us from making heart connections? And if that were the case, then I would be unpicking the trauma. And yes, in, in the work that we're doing, the people who've joined Accidental Gods, of course, as soon as you start really settling and really opening, stuff comes up. And we are having to work with that collectively and individually. Um, but it's not... I'm not doing the work in order to heal the trauma. I'm doing the work because the work needs to be done and the healing of the trauma happens because that's the way through. Does that make sense? Mm, yeah, no, it absolutely does. Um, Alexandra asks a, a question about, um, it's a beautiful concept, but isn't it exclusive? The people who struggle, survive, pay the bills, feed their children, how can they be a part? How can they make that space in their lives for this? Well, we've got, I have, students who are exactly doing that and and they are doing everything that they can you know i don't want to believe that conscious evolution is not open to everybody but if it were i still think it would be important for those who have the privilege of the space and the time to use the space and the time to do this i i genuinely can't see a way forward through everything the deep adaptation paper describes that isn't this. And if somebody wants to tell me a way forward through everything the deep adaptation paper describes that isn't this, I will listen with real interest. But this is my best answer for finding agency and a sense of a future that exists and that isn't being kebabbed over piles of burning tires. So my interest is in finding the people who can do this, but I am also I think this is open to anyone who wants to, and clearly there are vast swathes of the population who wouldn't be interested. That's, and in that sense, of course, it's exclusive. But we reiterate back to those of us who can do it and do do it, I believe, you know, that's the pebble dropped into the loch or the lake, or the still a bit of water, and the ripples move. And that's how change happens. Andy Letcher asks, um, does conscious evolution necessitate dismantling capitalism? Um, it necessitates dismantling everything that we believe to be true. But we're not dismantling capitalism in order to consciously evolve. We are consciously evolving, at which point capitalism ceases to be a thing. If we have radically transformed the nature of what it is to be human, then I can't imagine that capitalism is any part of the future of that because capitalism is essentially, uh, it only exists because we are cut off from the all that is. At the point when we are fully connected, heart space to heart space with the web of life, capitalism cannot exist. But we're not going about this as let's take down capitalism and then consciously evolve. We're going to consciously evolve and when we are there, capitalism will cease to be a thing. I, I quite like if it fell apart before that, but hey, that's a separate thing. 
<laughs> Thank you. Um, uh, Jerry Riverston asks, I'm curious what fora you use for ongoing discussions about conscious evolution. Obviously, you have your, your, uh, the website and so on, but mm. how is it um, integrated with other discussions that are going on? Um, minimally, to be honest, because everything I've got is, is keeping this ticking and keeping the flywheel spinning. Um, so we have the website, um, and we do webinars and Zoom calls. Uh, there's a Facebook group, which I don't attend very often. Um, and I do quite a lot of Zoom mentoring calls um, for people. So, uh, you know, it's, uh, and since lockdown, you know, we were planning to have gatherings which I spent most of this afternoon paying people lots of money back. So it's going to be Zoom, Zoom based uh, for the foreseeable future because I can't imagine at the moment dragging 30 or 40 people into a place where they all have to sleep in shared bedrooms. Uh, it's not going to happen. Uh, no, it's at accidentalgods.life. Um, hang on, let me put this up. There, that's the link. Um, yeah, so it's 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 web based basically. Yeah. Uh, you want more detail? You have to ask my partner who does the tech stuff. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Um, Emma asks, have you any ideas how you could ensure that asking for help from the increasingly interconnected web provides an authentic and helpful approach? And I think it was interesting right at the beginning where you kind of referred to the internet as being a kind of sign of the ever interconnectedness and rapid uh, speed. Yes, I'm not using web in the sense of the internet. Okay. Because because they're like big dragons. I when I say connecting to the web, I mean the web of life, the web of consciousness. And yes, our self-organizing connectivity interfaces are on the internet. But that's a very interesting question. Okay, I would need to really really think about that because I find the web, as in the interwebs, it is a very double-edged sword. But it is enabling us to connect around the world. You know, I, I set our intent for Accidental Gods that it go around the world in our very first Zoom meeting we had people from Australia. Yay! So it's gone. Uh, so, you know, this is letting us do this. But the internet is, is clearly full of uh, dragons uh, and pitfalls. That's being bad to dragons. It's full of people that I wouldn't necessarily trust. So my when I say connecting to the web of life, I mean the trees and the rocks and, and the red kite and the river. The connecting on the internet is talking with people about how we're getting on with this. I'm not sure that answered the question that was asked though. No, no, I think it absolutely does. And I think it's really interesting to think about those different kinds of nodal points. Yeah. Um, and and the, uh, back to the, the original question about authenticity and trying to find um, nodal points of, you know, that are really value to you in your journey. Yes, because authenticity for me in the shamanic work, you just test stuff. You ask questions and you, you, you know, you have your baseline of if I do this and this happens, then I will take it that that was effective. Um, and, and that's, yeah, it's fairly straightforward. If I, I, I asked my pony, I, I'm doing a course of tango with horses. This is slightly off, but it just happened last night. So it's still very fresh. Um, and the, so she's the two year old. And I said, I really want to dance with you. And last night for the first time in our two years of existence together she stood up on her back legs right in front of my face and just hung there in the air I, oh I, i'm not sure i meant dancing quite quite like that but that's really cool um so you know explore experiment the world once you start accepting letting the barriers down of what we believe is true the world is a very different place you know, and, and then you just have to make sure that you're not falling into traps of self-deception, which is obvious and easy. Uh, no, it's not obvious. It's, it's obvious that it happens. It happens easily. It's not obvious how to prevent it. But you know, really striving for integrity is really, really important and staying grounded, really staying grounded and testing everything. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much, Manda. It's great. Perhaps I could ask you one last question and then I think we might have to, to uh, wind it up at that point. But um, this is Judith and she says, can we still heal the paradigm we are in instead of making a new one? Um, possibly. I don't know how. And I don't know that, you know, I, no, I don't know. I, possible. 
and you're welcome to try. It's not somewhere that I would put my energy because uh, partly because I sit with the fire and I get instruction. I do what I'm told because otherwise life gets complicated. Um, but yeah, I don't know. If you do and you succeed, please let me know how you did it because that would be really, really interesting. But I think our paradigm is, is based on separation. It's based on the fundamental lie that we are separate from the earth. That is the paradigm that we live in. Mm. And I don't want to heal that. I don't want that to be successful. I want us to have a new paradigm. So, so I think probably not. Good questions. Really, really good questions. Thank you, everybody. This, that's that's yeah. good for us to think about. There's some brilliant questions out there. And if you followed the, the chat and so on, the, the kind of quality of the conversation going on there is absolutely brilliant and lots of really exciting things. Um, Amanda, you've given us so much to think about. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you, everybody, for turning up from all around the world. That was, that was really cool. Brilliant. Brilliant. All right. Uh, thank you. So um, can I just thank all of you, um, again, all of the attendees for joining us tonight and supporting the work of Schumacher College. Um, we have one further talk in this series, which I hope you'll want to attend. And we're already working on the next series, so we should hopefully go live with information about that in the next couple of weeks. Um, I hope Manda's talk has whetted your appetite, in which case I would point you towards Manda's Accidental Gods website, which is great. And I was just listening to some podcasts. There's some, some brilliant material there. Really exciting. Um, you may also be interested in some of the Schumacher College website where there are a number of MAs and short courses and so on that is also around similar themes. So um, there are lots of things you could do there if you want to pursue it further. Um, this has been our fifth online talk and we would love to have your feedback on how we can continue to improve. And also we'd love to hear about the issues, topics, speakers you'd like to see in the future. Um, and I'd like to apologise for not reading all of your questions because there are so many great points in there, but um, there's only so much we can do inside an hour. So can I thank you all again for your very active participation and thank you again, Manda. Um, such a, a great, you. thoughtful talk. Arkansas. It's so lovely to be back here. Brilliant. Thanks all. Have an amazing day, evening, whatever. <laughs> thank you and, and, and good night, everyone. Yeah. Go well. You're going to click a button. I am in a moment if I can find.